first telephones in Wisconsin were connected with lines directly from businesses to homes. And within a year, switchboards were being built. And in 1893, independent telephone companies sprang up all over Wisconsin. And by 1926, there were almost 1,200 exchanges serving 500,000 subscribers throughout the state of Wisconsin. The late 1800s and then the early 1900s were the formative years for many independent telephone companies, and it led to the formation of the Wisconsin State Telephone Association. 48 delegates representing 55 telephone utilities attended that first meeting in Madison on July 13, 1910. Hello, I'm former Governor Tommy Thompson, and I'm here today to talk about uh, uh, Wisconsin Telephone Service, the early beginnings of the telephone industry, and most importantly, the 100-year anniversary of the Wisconsin Telephone Association. And let me begin by just saying how proud I am of the association. Over the years, the Wisconsin State Telephone Association has provided support and resources to the telecom industry, making it one of the strongest associations, if not the strongest, of all the associations in America representing telephones and communications. This is a real big help to the small companies. We couldn't have got along without them. Because all our contracts with uh, <clears throat> Bell Telephone and, uh, and uh, a lot of the things that come up in the PSC, they would, uh, <clears throat> they would advise us of what was going on. Focus groups within the association also were formed to benefit communities in various ways. And we started the museum, the telephone museum, which was in Toma for a long time. Now it's in a warehouse up at Manoa, <laughs> looking for a home right now. We named the uh, museum the Harris Allen Museum, Telephone Museum. And Marion Allen supported it up till she died, which was maybe two years ago. She was one of the supporters of it. 100 years ago, the telephone was new. It was high tech. It was mysterious. And although simple by today's standards, it was the beginning of technology and the enabled social networks throughout the country. Party lines, rubbernecking, the precursors to Facebook and Twitter. I interviewed elders from the town of Arena and talked to them about uh, the values and the community that they lived in. And, but we had so much fun when we talked about the party line. They called it rubbernecking or rubbering when they listened in on when the neighbors were were speaking to each other and Alice Crook was 92 when I interviewed her and she talked about how she had 11 kids and she just didn't have time to rubberneck and other people did it all the time. She said it was worse than television. Oftentimes if there was a calf born breach and, and the farmer would call his neighbor, other people would listen, they'd be there before the vet. It was a remarkable social network. Adding to that feeling of community, switchboards were often located in homes. At one point we had the Cranmore switchboard in our house. Uh, Clarence Favel set up this Cranberry Telephone Company uh, for the benefit of the Cranberry Growers because at that time there were, they were all party lines and there were a lot of people on these party lines. This switchboard came from the early 1900s and this was usually kept in someone's home so that all your calls could be answered 24 hours a day. In our company we had a one position switchboard that was located upstairs over a, uh, a hardware store the operator would uh, spend probably 24 hours a day there. If she wanted to go to the store, she'd put a sign in the window that uh, she was across the street to the grocery store or people just waited until she got back. They offered advanced services similar to now. The primary difference, services were more personal. She'd call up the operator and would say, well, I'm going over to so-and-so's this afternoon. So if anybody calls for me, I'll be over there, and you just put the call over there. So uh, that was the first case of call forwarding, I guess. Coon Valley, Chaseburg, and Stoddard, they had two, <clears throat> two long distance lines between them. So <clears throat> if somebody made a long distance call, there's a good chance that all them lines would be busy. 
And the operator would say, well, as soon as a line becomes vacant, I'll give you a call and put your call through. Weather has always been a challenge for telephone companies. In earlier times, the lines were much more exposed. Back then, the uh, wires were open wires. Uh, some of them were iron wires, some were copper wires. When there was a little windstorm, if they ran near trees, branches would break off drop on the wires, tangle up the wires, and cause all kinds of problems. One thing a tr uh, out in the country there, why the tree would go over the line, <clears throat> probably bust the cross arm, maybe there was two or three cross arms on there. So if you fixed that one trouble, you'd probably clear 30, 40 customers would get them back into service. Ironically, weather presented new challenges or concerns as phone companies evolved. When the lightning and dark clouds come over, we shudder once in a while. It was the summer of 2000, a storm came through and we had straight line winds in excess of 80 to 90 miles an hour. So um, lots of trees down, uh, cables down and service outages all over. But my first concern or immediate concern, we had just put a, you know, the fall before had put a 27 foot satellite dish for the video product on the roof of our building. And my first call was to call and make sure that that satellite dish was still on the roof of our building and not laying somewhere in a road somewhere in town. And the industry, as with life, had some interesting twists and tales of trouble. In the halls of our headquarters in Toma was a sign. And on it was uh, a story about a woman who had called into Harris Allen. And so, as the story goes, she used to listen in on the party lines, the four and eight party lines back in that period. And so when she would listen in to other people's conversation, when she put the phone down or picked it up, it squeaked. And so they knew she was on the line. So she called them and says, I can't have this. And believe it or not, Harris sent on a repair person to oil her phone so that it didn't squeak when she listened in on those conversations. I got a call from the foreman early on a Saturday morning about 5 o'clock saying be ready we have a major problem and our tow facility was completely down. Lo and behold we go behind this bar at Elk Lake and there's a big fire in the ground and uh, we said what is going on? They said we're roasting a pig. Here about uh, midnight they, put the, they dug this pit and as they dug this pit the backhoe teeth followed the 400 pair cable that was in the ground and it straddled it and they dumped their charcoal and stuff in on the cable and so it went until things started melting together and taking uh, the uh, tow facilities down. Independent telephone companies have always been about local communities and their local service. It's in their DNA. That history of community continues as technology's advanced. We got into the video business much the same way that we got into the telephone business. And that is that in 1896, when we started as a telephone company, customers weren't happy with the service they were getting from their current provider. And so they made a request to look for an alternative and a group, group of local businessmen got together and formed the company that is now Wood County Telephone Company doing business as Solaris. In the late 90s, customers were not happy with the service they were getting from their current cable TV provider, and so they made a similar request to us to start offering that service. So that's really how we got into the service, offering video service, much the same way as we did from a telephone company. Not only have local independent telephone companies supported their communities, they've also led the industry in providing the latest technologies and services in this country. We started offering internet service, uh, dial-up internet service at 14.4 kilobits in May of 1995. Um, a year later in the summer of 96, we celebrated our 100th anniversary as a telephone company. And so at that point, you know, we, were, we had been a telephone company for 100 years. The internet was kind of in its infancy still and just getting started. The sea change kind of came about four years later in 1999 when we started offering high-speed internet and uh, video services. Probably about 10 years ago we started fiber to the home. By the end of uh, 2010 we will have 
everything north in our Baldwin Exchange built with fiber to the home. Looking back, the social networks of 100 years back were telephones, batteries, switchboards and homes, and large wires. The social networks of today are digits, virtual wireless, and visual. The last 10 years have had major impacts on the telephone industry, but there's always been that optimism for communication. When I first started here, I think we had approximately 2,400 access lines, and, and we almost made, a few years ago, 5,000, and now with cell phones and wireless competition, uh, we lose approximately 25 landlines a month. It's a more difficult industry to be in, and I think we all have to work harder at it, but it's certainly exciting and interesting and, and I think a great industry to be involved in. As the Chinese proverb, we live in interesting times. It, it has certainly been interesting. When I got elected governor, I can always remember that the telephone companies, you know, were my biggest backers and supporters, and I've always remembered the tremendous support and the great partnerships we had. So I thank all of those individuals who served on my task force. Larry Knigdorf, uh, who was then a, a powerhouse in the telephone industry, and Mr. Weir uh, was also a member of that uh, a great uh, task force. And of course, I have to say, you know, a few kind words because uh, they've been so kind and good to me. The three people in your association that uh, worked for me uh, when I was governor. Your executive director, Bill Especk. You couldn't find a, a better person. And Chris LaRoe, uh, he's the hard charger. And then you brought in Drew Peterson uh, to be the president of the association this year uh, during the 100th anniversary. So all those people attending this celebration and being involved with the 100 year anniversary, congratulations. Good luck and best wishes.